We all know that Riverdale on the whole is pretty ridiculous, but that's just part of its charm. Most of the time, it gets away with ridiculously far-fetched plot twists that just wouldn't work on other shows. But that doesn't mean that we're not left scratching our heads on occasion trying to figure out exactly how plausible some things really are. Over the course of the show's three seasons, we've seen murders, fake siblings, sketchy criminal parents, and more gratuitous shirt scenes than we can shake a stick at. If it seems completely nuts, then you can count on Riverdale's writers to put it in the series. It's such a fast-moving drama that we're often ushered on to the next story before we've had time to digest the last one, meaning that we end up forgetting about the huge, glaringly insane plot holes. That ends now. Join us as we take a look at 10 times Riverdale made absolutely no sense. When it comes to bad guys, Clifford Blossom had everything you might expect. And more. The man did away with his own son for goodness sake. It doesn't get any more duplicitous than that. Not only was he deliciously evil and calculating, but he even managed to make dying a devious deed. After he mysteriously met his fate, the surviving members of his family were waiting for his hefty fortune to fall into their laps. But of course, it wasn't that simple, and Cheryl was left disappointed when her dad's wishes came to light. Rather than having a regular real-life will that named his successors, Blossom threw a curveball. He put in a strange clause. If you can prove that you are related to him, you can get a slice of the pie cue all of the random relatives showing up. That's not even the weirdest part. The Coopers are distantly related to the Blossoms on Hal's side, and Clifford knew that, but he hated them with a passion. The two families were rivals from the start. Why would he purposefully leave them a ridiculous amount of money? Did Blossom have some sort of weird hidden guilt that we weren't made aware of? Or did someone tamper with his will without his knowledge? We just don't get it. Jughead stole hearts as the lovable kid with a troubled home life from the offset. Played perfectly by Cole Sprouse, the role turned the actor into a teen heartthrob, or even more so. From the very beginning, Jughead has been a waif. Living with his serpent dad in a rundown trailer, it's no life for a kid. It's clear that Juggy loves his dad, but the situation is dire. There's zero food, no money, and well, no hope. We could understand it if his mom wasn't in the picture at all, but she took off with her youngest child. His mom has recently made an appearance in the latest season of the show, but what gives? What kind of mom would take one child and leave the other behind when she's well aware that her ex is a notorious gang leader? Why didn't writers address the obvious plot hole earlier in the series rather than let her pop up in season three when the ship has sailed? Answers on a postcard, please, because we've got no idea. When something big happens in Riverdale, you can bet your bottom dollar that Jughead is about to write a thrilling expose in the high school paper. The blue and gold has frequently been mentioned in the series and has been used to expose the dirty dealings of many a character. While most schools have a newspaper of some kind, they usually focus on minute aspects of academic life, like the next cheer meet or the results of a football game. Not only are they pretty boring, but they're highly monitored by the teaching staff to protect students from printing anything scandalous. So, how on earth do Betty and company get away with printing what they do in the blue and gold? Not only that, but when the paper is released, it's treated like a copy of the New Yorker. Literally everyone reads it, from the kids to the adults who seem to really value it. Too much onus is placed on a paper that could never be able to print what it prints, let alone reach anyone outside of the school gates. We have so many questions about this one. Who sets the budget? Who approves the prints? We need to know! When Jughead transfers to Southside High, we're suddenly shown a darker side of Riverdale that we've only previously caught glimpses of. We all know it's ran by the serpents and it's a bit of a dump, but it's still a shock to see how run down Southside is in comparison to Riverdale High. The serpents roam around the halls in their jackets, carrying weapons and doing their dirty business dealings in the cafeteria. But why isn't anyone trying to control them? These kids are running amok and literally no one cares. Yes, this is Southside and all, but surely the school is still run by some sort of governing body that has to at least try to put a stop to all of this gang activity. Even if the teachers are too scared to stand up to their tearaway students, someone else would have gotten involved and given the place a darn good makeover. As far as plot holes go, this is one of the biggest we've ever seen in a show, and we've seen a lot. Oh lord, where to begin with this? In season two, one of the main plot lines followed Jughead as he left Riverdale High and moved over to the South Side to explore his serpent nature. Betty and Jughead have their fair share of relationship issues due to the separation, but Betty isn't willing to give up on her boo that easy. Dark Betty takes her biggest appearance yet in this episode, but honestly, it's so uncomfortable, it hurts. 
To show the serpents that she's friend and not foe, she decides to become a sort of honorary member. Betty attends FP's homecoming party at the White Worm, where she tells Tony about her desire to get in good with the gang. Suddenly, an old lady at the bar tells her that she has to do the serpent dance, and before you know it, teenage Betty is on the pole, throwing some incredibly age-inappropriate moves. For a start, why was there an old lady encouraging little blonde Betty from Riverdale High to strip and get on a pole in a bar full of old men? When we say full, that place was at capacity. We're talking a real fire hazard, and they're all just watching her like she's the Super Bowl halftime show. When she's done, FP takes the stage and asks the audience to clap for her. Why didn't anyone try to stop her and ask her what on earth she was thinking? When Betty convinces her mom to go and look for the child she gave up for adoption as a teen, no one could have predicted the storyline that followed. The mother-daughter combo found Charles, also known as Chick, on the streets and thought they were going to live happily ever after together. Chick promptly moved into the Cooper family home, but Betty soon became suspicious that he wasn't her brother after all. When the subject of Clifford Blossom's will came up, Betty was given the opportunity to DNA test her half-sibling to see if they were actually related in the first place. She steals a used bit of dental floss and sends it off to be tested, but the only information she gets back is that he doesn't have Blossom blood. As we already know that Betty's dad, Hal, wasn't Chick's father anyway, the DNA test is pointless and doesn't rule out whether or not Alice is actually his mom. Now, call us skeptical, but as far as we're aware, DNA tests don't work that way. Betty would have been able to definitely see if Chick was her brother from the results, not just whether he was related to the Blossoms. Betty and Juggy eventually just did what they should have done in the first place and went to the orphanage and got a picture of Charles. It emerged that Chick was really an imposter who had murdered the real Charles so he could take over his life. Duh, even we could see that coming. When season two wrapped up with Archie being arrested for a murder he didn't commit, we knew that the season three opener was going to be a big one, but we didn't realize quite how many questions it was going to bring up. In the first episode, Labor Day, Jughead explains that all four teens have been busy over the summer trying to get Archie out of jail. Betty has been interning with none other than Archie's lawyer mom. Helping him out is one thing, but actually physically representing him in court is an entirely different ballgame. How are we supposed to believe that a court would even allow that to happen? As a lawyer, Archie's mom would automatically know that trying to convince a jury that her own son didn't do the crime wouldn't work at all. No one would believe the mother of the perp. She'd actually be doing him damage by taking on the case. It's a head-scratcher that we can't get over. Plus, Betty is supposed to be the smart one, so why wouldn't she cotton on to the fact that it's not appropriate? We're not trying to be killjoys here, but let's think about the show as a whole for a moment. It's all about the complex relationships between the teens and adults of Riverdale, right? Every now and then, a suspicious adult turns up and drama unfolds almost instantly. With that being said, you would have thought that the characters might have started to sense a pattern with this. First of all, Mrs. Grundy had an extracurricular relationship with Archie, which wasn't her first dalliance with a student. Didn't the school ask for references? We can let that slide, but it just keeps happening. Across town at Southside High, Mr. Phillips is getting down with his bad self, simultaneously playing the part of caring teacher and drug dealer. Was there nothing in his past that might have indicated that this guy was a total menace to society and shouldn't be working at a school? Lastly, why didn't Alice and Betty save themselves a world of pain when they looked up Chick and asked for a DNA test before they accepted him as a Cooper? It's literally the first thing anyone would do in that situation. Season 1 introduced us to the complex family life of Veronica Lodge. Her uber-rich dad was in prison for his shady dealings, and when Ronnie realized the extent of his scheming, he hated him with a passion. Fast forward a season, and Hiram Lodge is back out in public and planning on making some big changes in Riverdale. Namely, he wants to turn the entire south side of the town into a prison so that he can make some serious cash from it. Let's put that in a different way for you. Former jailbird wants to build prison. Hmm. Something's not quite right there, is it? Prison is hardly a Ritz-Carlton. No one gets out and thinks, Man, that's a sector I'd really like to get involved in. Well, no one apart from Hiram Lodge, that is. Has he developed some sort of power trip that's made him want to be the one to put people behind bars rather than being the one put behind bars? Who knows? We've given up on trying to figure this one out. The gang likes nothing more than meeting up at Pops to have a milkshake and, you know, talk about the crimes they've committed. Call us crazy, but if we'd done something even remotely illegal and were worried about getting caught, the last thing we would do is meet up with our co-conspirators in the town's busiest diner where people could easily overhear. Not only that, but if Pops has security cameras, then you'd be pictured looking pretty shady. 
The police would be all over that evidence, plus there would be dozens of witnesses to link you all together. Why would you do that to yourselves? Not that we're professionals on the subject. In one episode, Betty, Alice, Jughead, and FP casually sit down at a booth and talk about how they got rid of a body and if they removed their prints from a car. No big deal, right? Given everything these guys have been through, you'd think they would have known better and just stay at home for a night. The mind boggles. Well, there you have it. We'd like to say that this is a full list of what doesn't make sense in the show, but that would be a lie. This is just a tip of the iceberg.